components that make up a complicated large assembly. There are a couple different ways to start a new part in SOLIDWORKS. To bring up the New Documents dialog box, I can simply select the New icon from the top of the UI or from the File drop-down menu by hovering my cursor near the SOLIDWORKS logo and going to File, New. Here, I can create a part, assembly, or drawing file, or I can use advanced options, like switching the template for my new file so it has custom settings. However, I'm fine using the default template, so I'll return to the previous screen by selecting the Novice button. Alternatively, I can also open or create new files from the Welcome dialog box, so I'll click Cancel to close the New Documents dialog. You might see the Welcome dialog box as the startup window when you first open SOLIDWORKS, but you can also access it by either clicking the house-shaped Welcome icon or by double-clicking anywhere on the blank area on screen. The dialog box opens, and like the New Documents screen, you have options to create one of the three main SOLIDWORKS file types, a part, assembly, or drawing file, as well as the ability to open recently viewed files. I'll create a new part file by clicking on Part, and a new blank part file opens. Throughout this course, I'm going to design parts using metric units. An easy, convenient way to see which units you are using is to look at the Unit System button on the lower right in the status bar. I'll click to expand the option, and here I can switch between different unit systems in a simplified way. If I need to use a custom unit system, I can click on Edit Document Units to change them from the Options dialog box. Just like the menu on the status bar, I can also switch between the different default unit systems that SOLIDWORKS has to offer. I'll make sure I have millimeter, gram, second selected, and click OK. With the unit set, I'm ready to start modeling. You may have an idea of a part in your mind, but before starting, consider design questions like, what feature should I use? What should my sketch look like? Or how should I dimension it? There is no single right answer to these types of questions, but to give you an idea of how to approach part design, I'll open a couple of completed parts and break down how they were created. I'll switch to this completed pin part. And notice in the Feature Manager that the pin is made from a combination of simple extrude features. If I expand them, notice as well that each of the features contains the sketch they were created from. The pin here is a simple part, but you can also break down more complicated looking parts into simple shapes. I'll switch to this bracket part, and to get a better look at the bracket's construction, I'll move the rollback bar in the Feature Manager to hide the fillet and hole features. As I walk back through the part, notice that the bracket is made of a combination of 3D extrusions, similar to the pin, with a basic rectangle as the base, not so intimidating at all. I'll expand the base extrude and select the sketch, and you can see that it's a thin rectangle that defines the height and length, so the extrude defined the width. But would it have been a better idea to sketch a large rectangle on the bottom that defined the length and width, and then extrude it up to get the height? The short answer is maybe. It's up to you. Both methods will create the same geometry, but I will mention that choices made while sketching here can affect how the part updates later on and how the part will interact with other ones in an assembly. With all that said, I'll switch back to the blank part file. In the next few lessons, I'll walk through creating the pin part from scratch, discussing several approaches for sketching and designing parts, as well as how to use features to turn those sketches into 3D geometry.